Greetings everyone, I hope your breaks are good despite all of the great events that transpired during that time. I'm sending this along to you to go over some things about what we'll be doing in the course. Um, and uh, on Thursday we'll go over the mechanics of the course more and do introductions and things, but I thought I would record this for you um, so that you could use this, in fact, and have it over the course of the semester. I know how Zoom fatigue sets in and can set in quickly, and so we'll be using the Zoom meetings not as lectures but as discussions for the week's materials. And I'll be providing you things like this throughout the semester too. So, Darwin, Marx, Nietzsche, Freud. Why these four? Not because they are canon canonical, canonical is the word, and though we can't ignore their status either. Their status is for good and ill well deserved, but their particular fame and notoriety was often prompted by those who had their own interests and desires in mind rather than what the work of the authors actually accomplished in their own lifetime. So the status of these works changes over time with the changing interpretations and circumstances we find ourselves in. But rather than address these interpretations in terms of a history of Darwinism or a history of Marxism, etc., we are turning to the text as a means to, as you go forward, interrogate the many interpretations of these authors and their works. It was once suggested that this course be a part of a series called uh, Figures in Thought, and I thought this was problematic because it implies a sort of great men of thought or great works perspective, and this course will not address these works from this perspective. Each of these authors was embedded in their world and emerged from that world, and each might have been substituted by another. For instance, if not Darwin, then Alfred Russell Wallace, if not Marx, then Bakunin, if not Nietzsche, then Ralph Waldo Emerson, if not Freud, we would be talking about William James, etc. Biography is important, but it's not primary here. To understand their work, is, it's not enough to know their personal lives, intentions, and ambitions. Instead, it's more important to understand the social world in which they lived. They raised the questions they did because of their experiences of everyday life within the social conflicts of their time. The concern orientation here, again, is around archaeology and genealogy in Michel Foucault's senses of the terms. That is, in analyzing the quote-unquote mysterious formations of knowledge that organize our consciousness of the everyday, and then tracing the lines of descent or the genealogies of knowledge. How that knowledge has changed based upon um, a claim to authority to speak truth about nature and society. Finally, these works raise fundamental problems that the sciences of life and society, that is, biology, ecology, anthropology, and sociology, seek to answer. And ironically, these sciences and disciplines also have their foundations in Darwin, Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud, at least their modern foundations. Now, the fates of all four authors are wrapped up in the works that came after them and have claimed them as predecessors. It's impossible now to read these works without being aware of the history and conflicts that have swirled around them. For instance, around Darwin, there's the association with social Darwinism and eugenics. Around Marx, there's the history of the Communist parties, the idea of the inevitable proletarian revolution and the utopian future that awaits. There's the connection between Nietzsche and German nationalism and Nazism. And with Freud, there are certain vulgar therapies. And worse, um, with Freud himself, sometimes a real misogyny. Now, there is a lot of debate over whether these associations are correct, just as there are debates over whether they or we should desire to have these works in the canon of post-human knowledge. They are all works imbued with the ideology of enlightenment. At least in terms of their importance, almost all would argue, and almost all would agree, that they provide the basis for our investigations of the relationship of human society and nature.
What matters is that it became possible to make these associations seem correct. This is the discomfort that they produce in those who have never directly encountered them, but know them only from commentaries or even more often from commentaries on commentaries on commentaries ad infinitum. And actually, it must be said that almost none of those associations that I just mentioned are actually true or consistent with the work by these writers themselves, as I think you'll see over the course of the semester. So let me say a few words about the continuities and discontinuities I hope you find um, in and between these works. And not just between them. There are often pronounced discontinuities between these authors and those who later claim these works as authorities in politics, science, and philosophy. The distance between, well, for an example, the distance between Marx and Darwin is probably much less than the distance between Marx and Lenin. The concept of revolution, for example, is drawn from the work of the French naturalist Cuvier, his essay on the revolutions of the earth. And even more directly, it's drawn from Hegel rather than from Marx, as I think you might see in the interviews and the letter that you'll read from, uh, with Marx and from Marx later on in the semester. Now, Lenin's view was much more in keeping with Hegel and utopian socialism than it was with Marx. Lenin looked to the historical teleology of Hegel's logic and phenomenology and tried to make it real in the world. Here's a little quote from his uh, a little, little piece he was writing and taking notes on reading Hegel actually exactly the time that the Russian Revolution took place. Truth is a process, passes in its development through three stages, life, the process of knowledge, which includes human practice and technique, and the stage, and three, the stage of the absolute idea, that is, of the complete truth. Life gives rise to the brain, nature is reflected in the human brain by checking and applying the correctness of these reflections in his practice and technique, man arrives at objective truth. And of course, the objective truth that arose out of this was the inevitability of the proletarian revolution, and not just its inevitability, but the ability to speed it up and to have it happen sooner uh, than history might naturally unfold. Now, likewise, with Darwin and social Darwinism, we find that the association is quite suspect, as is shown by the brief historical sketch. Though Darwin's relationship to the work of Malthus and Spencer, as well as his friend and supporter Thomas Huxley and his nephew and, and cousin, because both his nephew and cousin, Francis Galton, are problematic, and we will look at those. And the level of support, in fact, the that, uh, that Darwin might have given to, to their work, which I don't think was very much, actually. Um, now, pause to consider here that, uh, again, how differently knowledge was organized uh, before 1860, or say, 1859, when Darwin writes The Origin of Species, and the other works are being published then and after this point, say, between 1860 and 1890. The disciplines we know today, for example, English, sociology, economics, anthropology, geology, in the way that we know it today, political science, psychology, either did not exist then or were only in formation. Before the late 19th century, knowledge was divided into philology, natural history, civil and ecclesiastical history, that is, the history of empires, both holy and not so holy, the histories of ru rulers and tyrants, political philosophy, political economy. So we have a very different way of organizing knowledge right now. And the way in which we can see and use this reading of Darwin, Marx, Nietzsche, Freud is to help understand this transformation of knowledge and the continuities and discontinuities that are expressions of that transformation. And this might allow us to recognize whether or not such transformations are happening within our own lifetime as well.
So after continuities and discontinuities, the thing to keep in mind are the concerns, themes, and events that connect these authors. For example, education, illness, exile, or voyage, etc. They are all suffering from illnesses, in fact, often in great pain when many of these texts are being written. The causes were in keeping with the medical knowledge of the period as well for, as from trauma. Darwin suffered from seasickness during much of the voyage of the HMS Beagle. He in fact never sailed again, I believe, once he returned. He, he then suffered for the rest of his life from a still unignosed illness and a general fatigue. His son Francis also noted that Darwin suffered from nightmares for the rest of his life of what he witnessed of slavery in Brazil. In his library, in fact, the last books he purchased were on growing opium for medicinal purposes. Mark suffered from very painful skin infections and other illnesses of the poverty of the London slums he and his family lived in for so long. He writes in a couple of letters that he is writing as he lays almost naked face down on a table because it's too painful to sit or even to wear clothes. Nietzsche suffered from syphilis, or so it was assumed, though others contest this, however. And Freud is known for his cocaine usage, but this became necessary as his throat cancer, he did enjoy cigars, worsened towards the end. Marx and Freud were both forced into exile, where they lived out their lives. Well, Nietzsche was Im imposed his own sort of self-exile from Germany, as he did not want to be considered German. His most virulent rhetoric, you will see, is actually directed towards Germans in Germany. And Darwin, after he returned from his five-year voyage again, he stayed in semi-seclusion at Down House for much of the remainder of his life. So you'll see those themes um, and concerns and events. Uh, also, their social class in many ways, uh, too. They're all in some ways middle or upper class, obviously. Connect them and connect their works in various interesting ways. Now, there are some themes that connect the works, and I'll just mention those briefly, and here's, now I'll show you the slide of those, obviously. Um, there are social structures and the structures of knowledge that these works taken together oppose as ruthless critiques. And these topics include, across the board, slavery, race, and the slave trade. Darwin, for instance, was an, uh, was an ardent abolitionist his whole life. The social relations of capital and what they would like to live within them. Our relationship to nature and the environment bourgeois morality, sexuality, nationalism, degeneration, criminology, malady, madness. These are all themes that you'll find constantly in the readings that we'll do. And so hence my selection of the Magritte painting for the course graphic, because bourgeois society and the social relations of capital are the environment in which they all lived, and so too do we live ourselves. They each inaugurate radical transformations in our understanding of the world, and these transformations produce the sciences we know today of life and society that set the very limits of our own knowledge. At the same time, they do not close off the possibility of new knowledges and new disciplines. This is where you will find their interventions in what they thought would to be at stake, when they use the term, and it's found in Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud, of doing transvaluations. They're going to transvalue the values of their time. You'll also find these other themes and, and concerns, problems running through their works. There's an attention to materialism, the philosophical form of that. Marx himself did his, his dissertation on the Greek materialist Epicurus. There's the concern with chance and contingency, something very important in both the works of Darwin and in Marx, that interpretation is always open and can change, as I'll mention a little bit more. There's a rejection of idealism in favor of scientific rationality and experience, and they are enlightenment rationalists. There's an emphasis on both individual experience and on history. 
Darwin is always is very much about individuals observation and direct observation of nature rejection of a narrow or specialized intellectualism their works cut across the established disciplines of their time and cut across the disciplines of our time in fact too because their work doesn't subscribe to any of the disciplines that we know today and also we can say how they trans look at how they transform knowledge and create the basis for the disciplines that we do know, the specialties and social policies, in fact, of the present day. Their concern with these new objects of life, of knowledge, such as life and society. Because prior to Darwin, and you know, there wasn't as much of a concern with an idea of life. Um, and prior to Marx, society and social relations weren't seen in the way that we see them now as an essential aspect of ourselves. So let me just end with this little comment about interpretation and, and what we'll see in terms of the interpretations that these works will present to us. Foucault, or Michel Foucault, also mentioned once that, that reading Nietzsche, Marx, and Freud was to look at and experience different modes and different techniques of interpretation. But something that united those three was that the interpretation had become an infinite task, he says. It was never closed off and never ended. The, and this is a quote from him. The incompleteness of interpretation, the fact that it is always lacerated and remains suspended on its own brink, quote unquote, is what's going on here and is what's important to be noted in the works we're going to be reading for the course. It is, as Marx says, the ruthless critique that never ends in a resolution. Now, there's a quote from, from Foucault to sort of make that point. Freud says somewhere that there are three great narcissistic wounds in Western culture. One, the wound inflicted by Copernicus. The second, the one made by Darwin when he discovered that man descended from the ape. And third, the wound made by Freud himself when he in turn discovered that consciousness rests on the unconscious. I wonder whether one could not say that Freud, Nietzsche, and Marx, by involving us in a task of interpretation that always reflects back on itself, have not constituted around us and for us these mirrors in which we are given back images whose perennial wounds form our narcissism today. So I thought that was a nice quote from, from Foucault to start this off. Now, one reason that so much of this interpretation is open is in fact right from the works themselves. And one of the most striking ones is in fact the works of Marx. Marx's work is almost never completed. The German ideology, one of his great works, and the one of the first the second work he penned with with uh, Engels was never completed and and was never published in their lifetime. Capital was left unfinished as well. Engels, Marx only did the first volume, and Engels had to do the second and third volume itself. Capital was only the first of maybe five to seven work that would form an analysis of modern society, as in which or the modern society in which he lived. He only lived to complete the first volume of that that big work of his. In fact. You know, we can look at something as fundamental to Marx and Marxism as the idea of class and social classes and see just how there's this fragmentary aspect of Marx's work that again leaves it open to interpretation. We'll find this in a sense with, with, with Nietzsche and with Darwin and with uh, Freud, that they're, that they're opening it up for us to think about things and the ways in which they're presenting it and in different ways and in critical ways um, to those, those presentations. But they're still always opening up this interpretation. Now, again, because he never finished it, here is, uh, here's Marx's definition of class. This is from volume three of Capital. It's in fact the very end of Capital. And while you might find that Marxists talk about class and social class all the time, they actually dispute 
quite a bit with each other over what social class actually means. And part of that is, is because of this passage. Marx is defining class now. Wage laborers, capitalists, and landowners form the three great classes of modern society based upon the capitalist mode of production. It's a matter of dispute over whether Marx actually ever used the term capitalism. In fact, also note that there are three great classes of modern society, wage laborers, capitalists, and landowners. It is not just workers and capitalists or workers and owners. So to go on, the question to be answered next is, what is a class? And this arises automatically from answering another question. What makes wage laborers, capitalists, and landowners the formative elements of the three great classes? At first sight, the identity of revenues and revenue sources. For these are three great social groups whose components, the individuals forming them, live respectively from wages, profits, and ground rent, from the valoration of their labor power, capital, and landed property. From this point of view, however, doctors and government officials would also form two classes, as they belong to two distinct social groups the revenue of each group's members flowing from its source, valorization. The same would hold true for the infinite fragmentation of interests and positions into which the division of labor splits not only workers but also capitalists and landowners. The latter, for instance, into vineyard owners, field owners, forest owners, mine owners, fishery owners, etc. And here Engels adds, here the manuscript breaks off. Not just the fragment itself, but notice that in this fragment, frag <laughs> Marx speaks of the infinite fragmentation of interests made possible by the very social relations of capital. So these works don't close off interpretation, but attempt to open everything up to critique. This is what Marx meant when he wrote in his early 20s that he wanted to dedicate himself to, quote, the ruthless critique of all existing things, unquote. Critique itself must become subject to its own critique, he said. It's the critique that is not closed off, and it's never resolved or settled. It's what Theodore Adorno would later call a negative dialectic. So, from the course description, let me just remind you and, and sort of with this. Think about going into the course and the readings this way. Darwin placed us in the natural world and showed that we share a common origin in nature. Marx shows us how we have changed that nature and at the same time changed ourselves. Nietzsche raises the problem of what those changes have cost us in terms of what we have had to give up and what we've sacrificed in order to live in society. And Freud sought to understand how we might deal with the consequences of the civilization that this created. So the goal here is, is, is not to prove or disprove their arguments, and though I have certain affinities for each one, it's true, but the goal is to understand the views and the social context that shape them, and to tr come to an understanding, therefore, of some of what shapes ours. So that's enough for now. Next week we'll look at the origin of species, and I'll leave you a little note about that one in the same way. And, uh, and on Thursday, we'll meet to go over to say hi and to actually meet vaguely in person, <laughs> virtually in person, and go over the mechanics of the class and the like. So have a good next, good next couple of days, and, and uh, see you on Thursday.